Um, yeah, well, you know, thanks everyone for, for being here. And uh, this is a series we developed a few years ago where the, the whole aim is just to, to inspire conversation about conservation issues and with an eye towards uh, you know, local issues as much as possible. And this is the first one of, of, of this year. And, uh, and we're really excited uh, about this one. Uh, so our, our board of directors and staff, we've been going through uh, about a year and a half of developing a new strategic plan. And one of the elements that uh, we made a priority and and that cuts through all of our objectives and programming is really uh, to, to put a priority on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, uh, and to really start doing the walk of a healthy watershed for all. Uh, and so when, uh, when we were thinking about sort of who to kick this off, uh, you know, uh, Patty was the, the first name that came up uh, wow. I'm just so excited to sort of learn more about what she's been doing at Northwestern. Uh, if you uh, if you read her bio, she's a professor in the Medill School of Journalism and the inaugural director of the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research at Northwestern. Uh, and uh, just a remarkable set of things that she's done, uh, and I'll let her share more relevant background uh, as, as she wishes. But yeah, thank you again so much, Patty. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's always nice to, it's always nice to be back in Wisconsin, even if it's just virtually. And I wanted to tell you that when I met my husband, he was living alongside the Sugar River near Highway 69 and Riverside. So. I kind of feel like um, um, like I belong here, right? <laughs> I'm gonna uh, give me just a second to hide some controls here. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about people, pipelines, and water protectors, uh, Native American sacrifice zones. Um, a little bit about me. Um, my Ojibwe name is Waswakanokwe, which means torchlight on the water woman. And really it, uh, it invokes uh, spearfishing because torchlight used on the water at night. Um, this is who we were. We were fisher and still are fisher folks. Um, I'm a citizen of Mashkazibi, which is better known as the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwe. I'm a professor in the Medill School of Journalism, but I am phasing in my retirement. And I just stepped down as a uh, the Center for Native American and Indigenous Research Center's first um, director. And uh, I am an active and enthusiastic affiliate of that. Um, so I wanted to talk, I don't know why my, these floating meeting controls still pop up on my screen in the worst possible place, but I wanted to talk about seventh generation philosophy. Some of you may have heard this. It, basically is visionary thinking and it obligates um, the people of my nation to decide in the best interests of generations that follow us. So we're thinking seven generations into the future, some 240 years. And when you think about the really wicked problems that we as a society face, climate change, environmental degradation, homelessness, these are issues that you really, we really need to be thinking long range. Um, I also wanna talk a little bit about sacrifice zones. What is a sacrifice zone? Well, it's a geographic area that's been permanently impaired by environmental damage or economic disinvestment. The term is used loosely to describe marginalized places that bear the burdens of the industrial economy purportedly to benefit society overall as measured by abstract notions of progress or development. Um, and really, if you look at where the really big sacrifice zones are, they're often in places occupied by marginalized people, native nations, 
in urban areas, African Americans and Latinx people. Um, so there's there's an economic aspect to a sacrifice zone. Three examples: the Alberta tar sands, which is one of the dirty dirtiest places on the planet. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, Black Mesa coal and the legacy of uranium mining and a topic that is really important to the Ojibwe people, and in particular my nation, um, Bad River and Bridge Line 5. So the Alberta Tar Sands is the world's largest industrial project. It's the size of Florida. Up to 20% is surface mining with deeper deposits requiring steam-assisted gravity systems. Bitumen is heated and pumped to the surface. And bitumen is something that um, has been tied to some serious health issues in and among the Fort Chippewa and Diné people. Um, there's 120 oil sands projects that are pumping two and a half million barrels of diluted bitumen mixed with light crude oil and chemicals per day to US refineries. And in economic terms, it actually, if you do the math, it costs more to extract oil this way and refine it um, than, than the actual value of, of the oil. It's a really dirty process. It's a very expensive process. And um, it's taking a toll on the environment and on the people who, who live in that environment. Tailings, waste ponds containing arsenic, mercury, PAHs, other toxins found in the bitumen could fill 500,000 Olympic size swimming pools. The tailing pan, ponds leak 11 million liters a day into the Athabascan River. And, um, you know, this picture here is um, an example of some of the fish that are coming out of the river that the um, Fort Chippewyan people depend on. And these, you know, these fish have got three heads, they've got ulcers. Um, it's just really disgusting. Um, the health effects, there's been a 30% increase in cancer rates from 1995 to 2006. And biliary tract cancers, blood and lymphatic, lymphatic cancers that are so much higher than would be expected in a village of only 1,100. Three cases of colon JO carcinoma, a rare cancer where one or two cases in 200,000 um, would normally be found. And we're seeing these very rare cancers pop up with increasing frequency in this community. Black Mesa, um, Peabody Coal. Now, you know, this operation has shut down, but for many years, um, Coal was taken out of Black Mesa and piped to cities in the Southwest, Las Vegas, um, Phoenix, Tucson, via water. And at the time, the, um, the operators, the, the mining operators promised that only one teacup of water per year would be taken out of the aquifer. And that is not what happened. So in 64, it started in 64, it signed a contract with the Navajo to slurry coal, promised to take one teacup of water. From the 1970s to 2005, Peabody took 40 billion gallons a year from the Navajo aquifer. In 2005, it stopped the slurry operations, but the mine continued to provide coal to the Navajo generating station. It, that was its name. It was not owned by the Navajo Nation. Surface waters were drying up, and some of this was um, was exacerbated by drought conditions. But a lot of it had to do with Peabody. The the Hopi and the Navajo nations sued. Company hydrologists said the surface and groundwater systems were unrelated. Maintained that the surface water problems were drought related. The mine and the Navajo generating um, Navajo generating station eventually shut down in 2019. A thousand workers, mostly Navajo, um, lost their jobs. The Navajo Nation lost 300 million in annual revenue. And interestingly enough, what the Hopi and the Navajo are really doing now is pushing alternative renewable energy. And just a, 
just a, a little side pitch. If you've never seen the documentary Garbage Warrior, it has nothing to do with um, any indigenous topics, but it's really an interesting examination of how resistant we as mainstream, as a mainstream society are to change. And we refuse to change unless there's no other options. And in this case, the push for renewable energy might not have happened if the Navajo generating station hadn't closed down. Um, meanwhile, private and community wells are drying up. The water level in one well, 32 miles south of the mine, declined 17 feet. This gentleman here walking toward his, the place where he fills up because very few Hopi ha and Navajo have running water in the rural areas um, is Mervyn uh, Yoitawa, who um, did some interviews with some of my student journalists. And uh, I mean, it's amazing how difficult and how precious water is. Um, the early models indicated that if the usage stayed below 35% of the inflow, the aquifer could sustain itself, but those models assumed that mining would end in 2001 and didn't account for drought conditions. And what's, what's a, a double whammy in this is that the lower the water table dropped, the higher the concentrations of arsenic and uranium, which are naturally occurring in the Southwest environment, but because the water table dropped so low, the concentrations of arsenic are so high that the, the Hopi, when my students and I stayed at the Hopi-owned hotel, um, we couldn't drink the water there. Uh, and we were warned not to take extended showers. We were given bottled water because the arsenic concentrations in the water was so high. Um, and um, over the years, uh, you know, the, the uranium mining took place on the Navajo Nation. The U.S. government knew that it was dangerous. There were, um, there were policies in place that told mining operators to equip their workers with safety gear that wasn't done. Um, we all know that, you know, the Navajo miners experienced tremendous rates of lung cancers and black lung. And, um, and today there are 500 abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo reservation that have not been reclaimed. So um, when much, then the other problem is the potential for radioactive spills. And uh, when we think of Radioactive spills in US history, most of us think of Three Mile Island. However, the worst one was actually at Church Rock, New Mexico in July of 1979. The United Nucle uh, Nuclear Corporation Church Rock uranium mill Tailings Pond breached its dam, sending 1,100 tons of radioactive waste flowing into the Rio Puerco River, 93 million gallons of effluent. 80 miles downstream, and, and the, the farmers and the residents along the way were never told what was happening at the time. 80 miles downstream, levels were 7,000 times higher than background levels. Residents weren't warned, they waded into the water and complained burning feet, heat stroke, livestock. Um, again, water is so precious in this environment that you know the farmers and ranchers routinely use the rivers in the area um, that are only flowing at certain times of the year, you know, so the livestock are drinking the poison water and dying. Only 1% of the radioactive materials were recovered. Um, the government ordered the company to provide trucked in water assistance that ended in 1981. Farmers didn't have any choice, but to begin using the river again, 40 years later, it still is not cleaned up. Three Mile Island residents, this is a real irony, received an average 3.3 million. The Church Rock residents, mostly Navajo, received 2,000. And, that, and then we talk about Enbridge. Um, Enbridge Line 5. I, I hope you all have been following this. This is a really important issue um, to the Bad River 
band of, of Ojibwe to Northern Wisconsin residents in general. Okay, so Enbridge Line 5 starts from, uh, well, it, it continues it, Enbridge um, Line 3, uh, runs through Minnesota, but Line 5 begins in Superior, Wisconsin, and it flows right through, this is, this is my reservation right here, it bisects our reservation and then continues in a southeasterly direction. It crosses the Mackinac Straits here. And, um, and this is, I mean, it's a, it's a problem for us, but it's a real threat to the, the Great Lakes. Um, so the pipe is 645 miles long. It's 30 inches. It pumps two, not quite two and a half million gallons per day. It was built in 1953 with a 50 year life expectancy. Now, I'm not a math wizard, but I know that um, it's now way beyond its life expectancy. It crosses rivers, wetlands, and culturally significant sites. And I wanna play you an excerpt um, from a document, a couple of documentaries, um, one of which was produced by Vice and another by the, um, the World Wildlife Federation. So um, this, I think, explains the threat in um, very visual graphic detail. Enbridge has an extensive pipeline network running through the Great Lakes region, and one pipeline in particular running through the Great Lakes themselves. Line 5 travels from Superior, Wisconsin through the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and then splits into two 20-inch pipelines as it crosses the five-mile-wide strait between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron. The twin pipelines follow the contours of the lake bottom, reaching depths of over 200 feet. It's 61 years old. It's never been replaced. It's owned and operated by Enbridge, which is the same company responsible for the largest inland oil spill in history. So you've got the iconic image of the Great Lakes, and right almost directly underneath it, there's this ticking time bomb. This is what an oil spill would look like in the Straits of Mackinac. The colored dots show where the oil would travel within the lake's water tables. Red is near surface, yellow, mid-depth, blue, near bottom. The oil would travel far, fast, and in different directions. Already, after six days, these surface particles are down, heading into Rogers City, uh, 40 miles away from the Straits. Dave Schwab, a research scientist at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, created the computer models. I met with him to find out why the Straits were especially vulnerable to an oil spill. It's just this picture where it really spreads out there. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't run enough oil boom no. across to get any of this. And that's a consequence of this oscillating flow that's so powerful. The amount of water going through that strait when it's going one direction or the other at the peak is more than 10 times what goes over Niagara Falls. If only one of the aging pipelines in the Straits of Mackinac were to rupture and Enbridge was able to shut down the pipeline immediately, the best case scenario would be a 1.5 million gallon oil spill. We could find out very little about the pipeline. We just basically knew it was there. Um, in the age. When was this line last inspected? What, did, what were the results of that inspection? Uh, that's basic information the public should have and we just, we cannot get. We had filed two FOIA. Oops. They were ignored for the large part. The FOIAs were asking for inspections. We know that Enbridge went down and took footage, but they weren't releasing the footage and we, we weren't getting it from the federal agency, FEMSA. Finally, we decided we're gonna just dive it. And when we got out there, it was shocking. National Wildlife Federation divers captured footage of what many fear. He's in the water. Broken structural braces, and the pipelines covered in debris. But as the crew lowered their cameras deeper than they were able to dive, what they captured was truly worrisome. Sections of pipeline completely unsupported at a depth of over 200 feet. So um, here's a little bit of the Line 5 chronology. Um, so 
almost five years ago, our Bad River Tribal Council voted unanimously not to renew the easements. Um, so this gets really complicated, but at one time there was a, this idea of privatizing all the reservations in the country and reservations were, were privatized and allotted into individual parcels that native people were supposed to farm and pay taxes on and that didn't happen and we lost most of our land and, um, and with gaming, some of the excess funds are now being used by many nations, including Bad River, to buy back some of the land, uh, those original allotments that were lost, that passed from native hands to non-native hands. So um, the, and Enbridge had, ne had negotiated easements with some of those white property owners. When, the, when Bad River was able to buy that land back um, and those easements expired, Bad River elected not to renew the easements. It ordered Enbridge to decommission the pipe, um, remediate the soil. And in the next couple of years, Enbridge asked for mediation. It started with, uh, it offered us $3.25 million to renew the easement. We refused. And every couple of months, the offer went up and up and up and up. Um, Two years ago, it offered 24 million and Bad River refused. The company finally got the message that there was no amount of money that Bad River was going to accept to allow Enbridge to run that pipe across our reservation and cross our Bad River and our wild rice beds. And, you know, again, thinking about that seventh generation, we just weren't going to do that. So um, the company just refused to leave. And uh, in 2019, we sued Enbridge, and uh, then Enbridge started beginning and withdrawing condemnation applications. Um, and its new plan is to run the pipe around the reservation, which actually is probably worse because this area here around uh, Mellon is upland. It, you know, Mellon is about 1,800 uh, feet above sea level. And everything, you know, there's all these, there's the Pinocchies were once a very tall mountain range and all these rocks got stacked on top of each other over a couple hundred million years and then tipped forward. Well, I guess 1400 million years. Uh, that doesn't sound right. Anyway, back before the dinosaurs, um, everything tipped north. And so it, Every, you know, the south end of our reservation is upland. Everything drains north through our reservation, through our wild rice beds um, along the south shore of Lake Superior in, in Shawamigan Bay. And, um, and now instead of bisecting our reservation, which is bad enough, now we have, we're gonna have corners and um, more places where this pipeline can fail. So Enbridge is now negotiating leases with private landowners for 42 miles of new pipe. And meanwhile, in Michigan, um, fears were realized when an anchor from a tugboat in the Straits struck the pipeline, it damaged it, but didn't rupture it. The company reached agreement with then Republican governor to build a tunnel for the pipeline under the straits. A year later, um, new election, Democratic governor wants Enbridge to shut down the pipeline. Um, Enbridge sues saying, nope, we had a deal with the previous governor. October 2019, Michigan released its risk management study it, and it found that Enbridge couldn't pay the one point eight billion dollars, almost $1.9 billion in potential damages if the pipeline ruptured. So in May of 2020, Michigan ordered the pipeline shut down. It gave it a deadline. Um, Enbridge ignored it. Today, the pipeline is continuing to operate. It, uh, nothing's been resolved that I know. I haven't checked in the last week. So it's not all bad news. Um, and this is something that your group should be aware of, you know, tribes make excellent partners. And I know some of your members understand this because we have 
legal tools available to us as sovereign nations that other organizations or environmental groups don't have. And one of them is sovereignty. You know, tribal sovereignty refers to the right of American Indians and Alaska nations to govern themselves. We have the right to protect our sovereign lands. The US Constitution recognized Indian tribes as distinct governments with the right to regulate their internal affairs. And, um, and this is something, you know, when I grew up and took my civics classes and my political science classes, I learned about the federal government, learned about state governments, learned about municipal governments, never learned about tribal governments. And that's been one of the biggest changes, especially in Wisconsin since the 1970s and the Ojibwe treaty rights issue. Brings us to treaty rights. We have treaty rights. And this is, you know, this, the, what uh, people sometimes think of native people only in terms of a racial identity and really, you know, it, it, and I think that racial identity and distinctiveness sometimes gets us lumped together with African-Americans and Latinx and Asian-Americans um, we're just another minority group, but that's not the case. We have a political and legal identity. When the US government sat down to negotiate the treaties that coerced us into you know, giving up our lands, they recognized that we were sovereign over it. Otherwise, you know, um, you know, they, they, they realized that we had the right to, to, to give it up or sell it or be you know, coerced into giving it up. So treaty right, and this is a relationship that tribes have with the federal government. States are completely out of this conversation. Article six of the US constitution, this constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance there, thereof and of all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. So treaties, take precedence. And, you know, if you remember in your civics classes that there's a division of powers, the federal government has powers, the state has some powers, and anything not delegated to the federal government is assumed to be the purview of the states. Well, treaties are clearly part of the powers that the United States government reserved for itself. It's a federal power. So things like the Ojibwe treaty rights, 1837, 42, and 54, my tribe uh, was forced to give up the land that eventually became part of Northern Wisconsin, parts of Minnesota, and parts of Michigan. And in our treaties, we insisted on this language, the privilege of hunting, fishing, and gathering the wild rice upon the lands, the rivers, and the lakes included in the territory ceded is guaranteed to the Indians. So we don't just we're not just sovereign over uh, our own borders. We also have treaty rights in all the lands that we ceded to the federal government, with the exception of lumbering, which was specifically described in one of the treaties. Um, we have the right to hunt, fish, and gather rice upon the waters in all the lands that we ceded to the federal government. So. If you have those treaty rights, you have a property interest in protecting them. You know, it doesn't do any good if you, if, if we have the right to harvest wild rice, if there's no rice to be harvested anywhere. So the law understands that we have the right to protect our property interests. And that is something that has developed in, uh, into four judicial canons of Indian law. Um, the, the court understood that native people were at a distinct advantage. The negotiations for treaties happened in English. Um, you know, what do we know about property law and mortgages and liens and, and easements and, you know, all those things that are part of English property law that, that uh, was embraced by the Americans. So these are some of the, the judicial canons. One, Ambiguous expressions must be re resolved in favor of the Indian parties concerned. Um, Indian treaties must be interpreted as the Indians themselves would have understood them. Indian treaties must be liberally construed in favor of Indians. And you know, these canons involved 
over time from the 1830s. They were liberally used in the 1960s. And it's kind of retreated a little bit from them since the late 1970s. Another legal tool the tribes have is NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. This protects burial sites and cultural artifacts inadvertently excavated on federal or tribal lands. So if there's a highway that goes through Northern Wisconsin and they do some work on it and they unearth uh, uh, an ancient burial site or, or some funeral objects, NAGPRA kicks in. Um, it also sets up a procedure by which cultural items that are held by public institutions, it, it creates a system by which they can be returned. So for example, um, I, I'm one of the advisors uh, to the Field Museum and the field uh, beginning with the, um, the Columbus, Columbia Exp expedition in the 1890s, um, began gathering items from Native American communities, um, cultural items, art, bodies, um, and the provenance was really suspect. And they had a couple of very unscrupulous collectors. So NAGPRA required the field and all museums like it to create an inventory of all the items in their collection and a description of the provenance. How was it collected? Who, who acquired it? Um, and a lot of those items, they, there wasn't any provenance. So it had, the field had to share that list with all the tribes that it, whose items they may have collected. And then those tribes can request those items back. And so the field has been doing this now for the last 25 years, returning those items. And what's really interesting, the ex um, exhibition, there's gonna be a major exhibition opening up at the field in May of 2022. And um, one of the things the native advisors uh, basically said, <laughs> you have to do this or we're not gonna, we're not gonna work with you is um, in the exhibit, they're gonna fess up to some of their bad practices um, and basically apologize. So it also creates penalties for trafficking in human remains. Um, and the state that I live in has the highest number of unreturned human remains, 13,000, almost 14,000. Only 270 items have been returned since the law was passed in 1990, um, probably because there are no federally recognized tribes in Illinois. The other, the other thing, and some of you conservation people probably are pretty familiar with this, is treatment as a sovereign or treatment as a state status. So TE, TAS is a regulatory authority, including over non-Indians on, on a reservation, which may be de delegated to an Indian nation under the Clean Air or Clean Water Acts. So an Indian nation with TAS is treated the same as a state for purposes of the Clean Air or Clean Water Act. It's a really onerous process. And it took my tribe 10 years to get our TAS for, for water. And I think even longer to get our TAS for air. But this was um, the, the law that the Moleko Ojibwe and the forest, well, the Moleko Ojibwe were able to acquire TAS for water. And it was one of the legal tools they they used in, in basically um, getting the, the Exxon mine at Crandon, um, basically to keep the mine out. Um, and Forest County Potawatomi, I believe, got TAS for, for air. Um, they also uh, were able to establish, um, what was it called? Um, class one air quality, a class one air quality designation. There are places in the United States where the air is so pure that Congress recognized that it was worth protecting. And the Forest County Potawatomi were able to get a class one air quality designation. And I believe they were the first 
tribal government to acquire class one air quality standards. So um, an Indian nation with treatment as a state takes authority for all delegable portions of the act or for certain sections. So in other words, if the way I understand the law, um, if, if a non-Indian comes on to the Bad River Reservation, let's say they have one of those allotments that was lost during the allotment era, um, and we find out that um, their, septic, their septic system is failing, the tribe, if it has TAS, can order that property owner to put in a mound system or somehow, you know, address that. And, um, and interestingly, I don't know of very many instances where a tribal government has actually exercised TAS over non-Indians because I think um, with the makeup of the court right now being very heavily states rights and conservative, um, there's a concern that, um, that we may lose more of our sovereignty if we, we try to exert that power, but legally we have it. So the other, the other um, legal, uh, the other legal strategy is invoking traditional cultural property. And this is a really problematic law. So it involves a, a, a location associated with traditional beliefs of a Native American group about its origins, its cultural history, or the nature of the world. A location where Native American religious practitioners have historically gone and are known or thought to go today to perform ceremonial activities in accordance, in accordance with traditional cultural rules of practice. Now here's the problem. Who pays for the traditional cultural property investigation? The company that wants access to the disputed sacred site. So here's an example of, um, of how this law works and why it's problematic. Um, well, I wanna say maybe 15 years ago, there was a, a company that wanted to pull out submerged timber in, in off the coast of the Red Cliff Reservation. This timber had been um, mostly white pine and some others that had been in Lake, Mich uh, in Lake Superior for uh, almost a hundred years. And this company made high-end musical instruments. And apparently the, the submerged lumber was perfect for making guitars and some other instruments. So it wanted to do underwater logging and the Red Cliff people um, opposed that and said, no, invoke, invoking traditional cultural property saying, you know, at this point after a hundred years, the logs had, had um, that people were still doing ceremonies at that spot in, in Lake Superior. And um, from an environmental point of view, those that down submerged timber was creating cover for, for fish. So it was important fish habitat. So um, the company hired an anthropologist who interviewed elders and others on the, um, on the Red Cliff Reservation. And his final report said, nope, this wasn't, you know, the, the, the Red Cliff could not, con um, could not claim that this was an area that was used for spi spiritual or religious practices because the Red Cliff have no religion and no spiritual practices. Actually said that in this report. And of course, you know, this was, this was a study that was um, obviously problematic, but done from a very Eurocentric perspective. You know, some people need to see stained glass and steeples in order to recognize a place that's sacred. And, you know, with nature-based religions, um, people are praying for that place. You know, that's, that is the religion. Um, but that wasn't seen, you know, by this, this non-native anthropologist. So TCP has some problems with it. If you're interested, um, I've shared this presentation with Hannah. And so if you want to do more reading about environmental pol policy or sovereignty, treaty rights, uh, TCP, NAGPRA, treatment as a state, 
here are some links that you can go to. And I'm going to stop there. And, um, and I'm interested in, if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to try to answer them. Or if you just want to talk, <laughs> share, um, that's okay with me too. But I'll stop there. And we do have a few in the, in the chat box to start with. For okay. those of you um, who would like to unmute um, and speak up, you are welcome to do that as well. Um, but I'll read the ones in the chat to start. Yeah. Okay. That um, that um, oil uh, the documentary is um, produced by Motherboard, and let me do a quick. It's something like Oil and Water, Oil and Water, the Dirty Secret. There it is. Um, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this in the a link to it in the in the chat. Okay, there you go. Um, so Robert, so often agreements are made related to mitigating impact, immediate impact on land, water, and people, and then unfortunately lead to broken promises and a legacy of envir environmental damage. You think, <laughs> sorry, how can we collectively via organized efforts, partnerships, avoid the likelihood of broken promises in the future? Oh, that's a really good question. I don't know, I don't know. Does anybody have any ideas? I, I'd be interested in what you all think. I mean, this is, this is what your organization is all about. Well, and uh, yeah, and, and thank you so much, Patty, uh, first, but uh, I think in response to that, you know, I appreciated you calling out uh, partnerships because, you know, even though Upper Sugar River Watershed Association has a, has a focus on the Upper Sugar River watershed, we're, we're really recognizing and, and the past few years have been working to create much broader partnerships. And, and my thought is to, you know, have a, have as part of our moving forward plan, some uh, proactive partnerships rather than, than the, oh shit, what do we do now? We've got a problem mm -hmm. kind right. of creating partnerships. And so uh, I, I think, uh, you know, that is something that we can begin moving towards. And I know there are sort of groups and individuals here that would be would be really good to partner. So I, I really appreciated the call out on partnerships. Absolutely. And you know, I'm thinking back to, you know, some of the really major environmental struggles in Wisconsin. And going back to um, you know, at one point there was the the I don't know if it was the US Department of Energy at that time or the Atomic Energy Commission. But they had put the Wolf River batholith on a short list for a nuclear repository. And um, the Menominee Nation and a lot of the surrounding communities really worked, you know, hard collaborating to try to, um, you know, put the kibosh on that. And thinking about the Exxon mine at Crandon, um, there is absolutely no way that little Mo Lake or the Forest County Potawatomi who were, um, you know, much less economic solvent, you know, than they, than they are now. There's absolutely no way that they could have turned back that mine had it not been for the Sierra Club, the River Alliance, the Timber Wolf Alliance. I mean, all these environmental groups and social justice organizations that, um, that lined up, um, you know, I remember, waiting for the Merrimack Ferry. And um, and I, I love little weekly newspapers and there was a, a, a newspaper stand and, and it was one of those small little tabloids and it had the, you know, the dotted like clip out to, the, the scissors, you know, where you clip out the, the coupon. And I thought it was a, a coupon on the front page because it had that little, and I pick it up and I look in it and, and I see, um, call your legislator, 
Um, it was right after Exxon had um, issued its environmental impact statement, and they actually had a line in it that I'm not, I, I'm not making this up. I, may, I bet Kurt remembers this. The solution to pollution is dilution. And so in, they, couldn't, they couldn't dump the effluent, the effluent in Swamp Creek because it drained into the Wolf River, which carried an outstanding resource waters designation. So instead, they were going to pipe it 35 miles to the Wisconsin River, which was already polluted. And so what's a little bit more pollution? And the people in Merrimack were furious. And you know, here's a little tribal newspaper, a little local newspaper, a hundred, I don't know how many hundred miles south of, of, of Crandon, um, you know, calling for their legislature. Leg legislator to um, to vote for a mining ban, you know, a moratorium. So I think there's there, I think networks and partnerships, alliances. You know, I'm really excited right now about the whole um, rights of nature movement. Are you all familiar with with what's going on there? There are um, it started in Ecuador, which passed an amendment, a constitutional amendment, recognizing that nature had the right to thrive, survive, and persist in its cycles. And that was followed by New Zealand recognizing the personhood, which is a really interesting concept, the personhood of the Wanganui River, which is sacred to the Maori people. And then Australia passed a law um, the White Earth Ojibwe um, recognized the personhood of wild rice. Um, and these movements are happening around the world. Uh, and there are conservation groups and environmental groups, just like yours all over the planet that are banding together around these sort of core values. And, um, you know, the, the, the Toledo City Con Toledo City Council? Is the Toledo on, on Lake Erie? It is, isn't it? Oh. Yeah. The Toledo City Council voted to recognize the personhood of Lake Erie and, um, and, and it passed a rights of nature ordinance acknowledging the rights of Lake Erie. It got thrown out by a judge a federal judge uh, a couple of months later, but you know, this is th this is a really interesting movement, and so it kind of speaks to the, your networks and alliances. And I kind of went on and on and on. Sorry about that. I get excited about rights of nature now. So there's a question about um, could TAS be used to stop Line Five? That's one of the legal tools that my tribe is using. Um, they're pulling out the stops. They're, you know, uh, cultural property, NAGPRA, um, outstanding resource waters, uh, sovereignty, treaty rights. They're, you know, it's the whole legal kitchen sink that they're throwing at Enbridge. Oh, Stacy, thank you. Um, do you have time? Tell us a story about one of your favorite Wisconsin environmental activists who made a difference. I know you know many well. You know, I actually have a book, if you're interested, called Seventh Generation Earth Ethics, and it's a collection of biographies of, of environmental activists, one from each nation in Wisconsin. Um, you know, uh, there, is, there are so many. Uh, Walt, Walter Brissett was an amazing, interesting man, but the the the, um, and I probably, uh, if you asked me a year ago, I would wax poetic about Joe Rose, who was my mentor at Bad River. Um, but Joe passed from COVID and I'm, I'm, I won't be able to talk about him um, without losing it. So I'll talk about Sparky Waka, who was um, a Menominee environmental warrior who, um, when the, going back to this Wolf River Batholith, um, 
the lower Wolf River already had outstanding resource waters designation and, and um, Sparky quietly got that designation for the upper Wolf, which made it impossible for the Exxon mine to, to dump its effluent into the Swamp Creek, which drained into the Wolf River. That was one of the things that he did. The other thing he did was um, he, well, and this again goes to alliances. Uh, when Exxon um, was hoping to do what would have been North, one of North America's largest uh, sulfide mines, when it was trying to site that mine at Crandon, um, Hillary Sparky Walkout was really involved in that. But he also was really a strong supporter of my tribe when we were going through our walleye wars. And um, he was a, a, never forget this. He was um, the chair of the Menominee County Board. I'm, it's really complicated, but the Menominee Nation is also, you know, they're situated in Menominee County and they have two streams of leadership, tribal leadership and, and leadership as a county. And Sparky was the county board chair. The Wisconsin Counties Association was trying to abrogate the treaties and banded with um, similar county people in the state of Washington to put together this anti-Indian conference in Salt Lake City. And Sparky, um, as a member of the Wisconsin Counties Association, decided to attend and they wouldn't let him in. And it was clearly because he was Indian. He, he had the credentials, but they wouldn't let him in. So he held a news conference on the steps of the Salt Lake um, City, or the, the, uh, the, the state capital uh, in Salt Lake, and, um, and basically said that only cockroaches do their business in the dark. <laughs> and and uh, he, he was amazing in supporting, you know, the Ojibwe. And at one point, he um, he was quite sick at the time, and there was this major rally in Wasa in support of Ojibwe treaty rights. He was hospitalized, and he had already been given last rites by a priest. He was Catholic. He had been given last rites, and he's in his deathbed. He got out of his hospital bed, had one of his children drive him to Wausau and got up on a podium and delivered a, a speech, went back to the hospital and I think he passed like three days later. He was an amazing individual. So if you have an opportunity, Google Hillary, but he was known as Sparky, um, Sparky Waka, W-A-U-K-A-U, -A -A an amazing man. What do you think we have time for one more question? Robert? Do yeah. you have a question? Yeah. Oh, is there? It looks like there's one more in the chat oh, okay. as well. Um, I'm wondering if any tribal protections are available in the fight to protect the Boundary Waters area. Yes, the uh, Minnesota Ojibwe the Grand Portage and um, and some of those uh, those northern Minnesota tribes also signed treaties. Uh, Grand Portage signed the same treaty that we did. It's in a different um, coalition, but it signed the same treaties, uh, same session treaties, and has um, treaty rights in those areas. So there's definitely a, a legal tool that it, it could use. Is there anything we should be doing proactively to protect the upper Sugar River watershed through our local village governments and state? Although we are on ancestral land of about seven different nations, I don't know what treaty rights would cover this area. Well, you know, unfortunately, um, the Ojibwe are the only ones that that insisted on the right to hunt, fish, and gather off reservation. So the Ho-Chunk and the Menominee, the Miami, um, I'm trying to think of what other, 
what other tribes would have been here, Kickapoo, Sauk, Fox. Um, they don't have treaty rights. So that would not be a legal tool that could be used. Um, but, you know, I, I think it would be worthwhile um, talking with Bill Quackenbush, who's the tribal historic preservation officer for the Ho-Chunk Nation. And um, I don't know offhand who the TIPO is at Menominee, but, um, and, and the other tribes have been removed out of the area and they've been gone for quite a while, but the Menominee and the Ho-Chunk, the Ho-Chunk especially, um, it'd be worth a call to, to see if there are ways that you could align because they have an interest in protecting their ancestral lands as you do. Are there any um, burial mounds in the area? That would definitely kick it up into a higher level of priority. Um, so I guess that's that's what I would that I would I would explore that. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, and boy, that's such a good question to end on. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think you've given us a lot of stuff to to move forward. And again, just uh, you know, thank you so much. It was wonderful to see you again, and uh, I I feel motivated and inspired so thank you oh great thanks well and i'm uh, you know i'm in the process of kind of i'm i'm finishing up some some grants and um and i hope my husband and i'll you know plan to come back to wisconsin so see you in a, maybe a year and a half or so well thank you thank again. you again all right miigwech gigwabamen yep. miigwech and, thanks and for thanks being here, everyone. everybody. Our next conversation is on February 8th at the same time, and it'll be Matt Walrath speaking on purple loose drive control. Should be good. Have a good evening, everyone.